Um, and I have another prayer for this morning. So the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. A prayer for safety and well-being of our school. O oh God of light and goodness, this morning we pray for all our families at Palmer Trinity School. May each home be a beacon of love and kindness, nurturing our children in the spirit of compassion. Help us to live lives dedicated to having healthy relationships that foster positive accomplishments. May your holy presence be felt in Nashville, Tennessee at this time of grief and mourning for the victims of the tragedy. Help us all to live in peaceful ways, making an effort to understand the power of prayer and the need for healing in our world. We ask all this during this holy time of Lent, in the name of your Son, Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, today's speaker uh, is no stranger to Palmer Trinity Community. She's been with us, I think, six years, over multiple times, um, coming and sharing her wisdom and her knowledge with our community, and we really appreciate Anna for doing that. Anna Moreno is a therapist, interventionist, therapeutic consultant, and an educator in Miami, Florida. She's the co-founder of RNA Therapeutic Consultants, a Miami practice offering therapeutic consulting and interventions in both Spanish and English. She's the co-founder and clinical director of Family Recovery Specialist, an intensive outpatient substance abuse treatment program. She is also the associate clinical director of Lucida's Multicultural Cultural Program. And has worked in the mental health field for more than 21 years. She enjoys utilizing her own multicultural background and upbringing to help guide families through treatment and recovery process. She has earned her undergraduate degree from the F from FIU and her graduate degree from St. Thomas University. And as a licensed medical health counselor, a master, master's level certified addictions professional, a qualified clinical supervisor in the state of Florida, a certified intervention professional, and a certified ARISE interventionist. She is also a certified facilitator, a facilitator sorry, for the Daring Way curriculum, a shame resilience approach effectively utilized in working with individuals recovering from substance abuse disorder. Ms. Moreno is a professional member of the Network of Independent Interventionists and the American Counseling Association. I, she spoke to our students last month, and I'm uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say and sharing with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry you had to hear all of that. I would have <laughs> pulled that off in that. Um, the most important thing I, I, I would say is that I'm a human being that has had very wonderful teachers in her life, which is the, 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 the families that, that I work with. Truly, if, if, if we boil, boil all of that down. Um, it is definitely a privilege for me to be back here with you, uh, or, or to be back here at Palmer Trinity six years. Wonderful, wonderful folks here. Um, Mr. Roberts, bang up job, you know, as the head of school. Ms. Sena that I see back there, thank you so much. Uh, you know, so many people here that, that, what I appreciate is that the value systems that you instill in your children that are paralleled by the school that I'm able to come in and play a, a small role in, in all that you do. So um, there's a lot of information that, that I'm going to cover today, and I'm going to go quicker through some things versus others, uh, because this is, you know, what, what, our, what, what our kids are facing today um, is just so many things, you know. <coughs> Just in hearing in the prayer, just what happened in Nashville yesterday, it's like, unfortunately, we're hearing about this way so often, and um, our kids have to cope and deal with all of this. So we want to make sure they have the healthy and healthy skills. So um, to get started here, you know, since they're always harassing us, I have a way of us getting back with them. So how do you frighten the new generation? Put them in a room with a rotary phone and an analog watch, a TV with no, with no remote, then read the directions written in cursive. <laughs> we win. We do have a payback for them. Um, but on a serious note, 
Uh, I want to think about normal, average adolescent development. These are things that these kids go through. They're totally unconscious. They don't sit there and think about, hmm, this is what I'm going to be striving to achieve so that when I turn 18, I can move out, right? But then they turn 18, they're like, nah, you know what? I changed my mind. You can't live without me. I'm staying, right? So, so these are the four things that they're working on. The first one, in, in no particular order, is autonomy. Um, they want to be able to self-govern. This is something that's important, right? We want them to be able to make their own decisions in their life and be able to stand up on their own to feet. So they'll start to struggle with this in adolescence, right? It's like, you have a curfew, you have to be home at midnight. Midnight, nothing, nothing gets started until midnight. My friends can stay up till one, and you know, so they're gonna start to do some of this pushing back, and that's phenomenal. We need them to do this. Now, what's the parent's job to push back? Right? Be like, no, it's midnight. I don't care what the other people are doing. I used to hear that in my house all the time. You know, I don't care what they're doing. I'm like, come on, they're older than I am. How much older? Two months. I'm like somebody that's more responsible than I am. So please, right? Uh, individuation. They realize at some point that they're not an extension of mom and dad. Right? When they're growing up in their middle, mom and dad is like, Right, you have the, the gods, and then one day they're like, wait a minute, you know, I'm my own person. And they start to develop, and they're gonna test those waters, they're gonna test the value system, they're gonna test all of those things. Um, at some point, they, they come to the realization that they need to separate, and that doesn't mean, you know, uh, breaking the family relationship, right? But it's like, oh my gosh, one day I am gonna have to move out, stand up on my own two feet, take care of myself, take care of my own life. And the last one is cooperation, which I think takes the longest to learn, which is, oh my gosh, if I'm gonna be living in a family or in any type of community, the university, work, I have to cooperate with other people in order to survive, right? And, and that one usually takes a long time. The adolescent years, by nature, are very selfish. They're only thinking about themselves. And then I look back on my life now, right, and how many times did my mother or my, or my father say, what's wrong with you, weren't you thinking? And I'd look at them like a deer in the headlights, you know, like, you know, I have no answer. But now I can turn around and say, and I have told them, of course, once I've learned what I've learned, yeah, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't supposed to be. You know, so I did what I had to do and frustrated you. <laughs> The development of the brain, we gotta know what they're capable of doing and what they're not capable of doing at certain ages. The brain develops from back to front. So the reward center of the brain, that part that lights up when we're doing something we like, is fully developed more or less at about the age of 12 or 13. So if your child enjoys a sport, they're playing that sport, the reward center's going off. If they like going, you know, riding roller coasters, boom, that part of the brain is going off. And then they start reaching that point of the development of the emotional maturity. So reward center's done, and as we go moving forward, we have a part of the brain called the amygdala. It's about the size of a walnut. And what is stored in there is a couple, couple of, lots of things, but a couple of important things. One is the fear factor. Are teenagers, generally speaking, fearful? No, right? They're like, what's wrong with jumping off the second story, you know, the house, there's a pool right there, and I'm in the pool, and we're all like, ah, you're gonna break your neck, and you're gonna miss, and you know, <clears throat> that fear for them, not very well developed. You have to be their fear, right? You have to be the ones that set the limits and the boundaries for them to help them control that fear. The next thing that is stored there is the feel good of anything that they like. Doesn't store the consequences of some of the things that they like if it's not good for them. This just stores the feel. So as we continue to move forward, the last thing to develop fully is the executive function. That's the part that allows us to stop and think about what can possibly happen, right? If, you know, in the morning driving over here, there's a lot of traffic and you see, oh, look, that, 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 the side lane, you know, the one where people stop and they break down, oh, look, that's, that's empty, I can hop on this and pass 27 cars. We don't do that. Well, some of us don't do that. <laughs> uh, I take that back, right? Because uh, I know I've seen it a few times, I'm sure you have. 
just like you know those, those, those barriers on the on the express lanes, right? <laughs> People that just jump over them. Well, you know, most of us have the ability to stop and think about that and think, you know what, that's not a good idea. You know, there's there's risk that's involved and that's not a good idea. Now, some people may do it anyways, but the thinking through was there. So, who, the, the age that this is fully developed more or less is the age of 25, right? At what age does car insurance drop? 25. 25. They're the ones that hold out till the end. The drinking age, 21, and I'm gonna get into drinking a little bit as to why 21 is the legal age. So um, it's taking, you know, that's pretty much how long it takes for it to be fully developed. Statistically, we're living longer. It's not uncommon to hear about people turning 100, 101, Somebody the other day I saw it on Yahoo was 114. Be still my heart. Um, you know, so those those years of life really have not been added to the end of life. It's really been added to between the ages of 20 and 30. People are taking today longer to get married, longer to partner off, longer to have children, right? So we're really seeing that this young adulthood is is being stretched out. So the good news is, um, your son or daughter probably will move out by the time they're 40. <laughs> so you have a wonderful opportunity right, to, to take advantage of this extension uh, of life. Today we have all this technology, and I'm going to date myself. I grew up with all of this stuff. <laughs> We were going to the beach, you had to take the big old boom box, right? If you wanted to take pictures, you had to take, you know, your camera. If you didn't want to take the boom box, you had to take the Walkman with 32 cassettes so that you were able to change, right? With whatever music you wanted to hear. And it's not as easy if you want to hear the song that's at the end of that side, you have to sit there and fast forward, stop, play, no, stop, fast forward, play, right? Now, they have it all, we have it all in a cell phone. Right? Kids are growing up in a world of immediate gratification. <clears throat> I am an immigrant to technology. Your kids are native to technology. They've grown up with it. <coughs> if they need an immediate answer for anything, bam, you go to Google, right? Snapchat, you have all of these things and all of these apps that are coming out that, you know, have all these wonderful benefits, but they really don't because we don't have access to them. There's a fairly new app, I don't know how many of you have it. Have any of you heard of the Telegram app, Telegram? Okay, good, I have a number of people nodding yes. Telegram, Telegram now has become very popular for kids buying substances. Yes, so it's an anonymous, you know, you send, you put out a message on Telegram, somebody will respond, and then you'll have substances delivered to your home. Oh. Telegram is the, is, is the latest one that, that has come out for that. And it's very difficult to keep up with everything. We try and be one step ahead, and then the, the creativity comes in, and they're one step ahead of us. So <clears throat> we have to be careful with all of these things. Um, in, in, in the last few years, <coughs> And COVID has played a major role. The pandemic has played a major role. Finding more teens and young adults really struggling with the word no. Give, saying no, it's creating these meltdowns, it's creating very strong emotions. It, it's, they, they're not able to handle it because this, this is part of it. Everything is immediate gratification. I want what I want and I want it now and a cell phone can do that. You know, technology can do that. So we need to definitely keep this in mind. Oh, and, and the dating apps, right? Dating apps uh, as well are very, very um, precarious for, for our youth. Vaping, vaping. Vaping is the addiction historically that has grown the fastest. It is a very prevalent problem. Um, <coughs> lots of young people are, are utilizing these devices. These are devices that can easily be, you know, put in a pocket. You know, girls or somebody sometimes put it in their in their tops, um, and 
the accessibility and the ability to use is very, very prevalent. You know, bedrooms, you know, bathrooms uh, all the time. And I'm going to go into, uh, I'm going to put it on here. Nicotine is one of the most addictive substances. So the, the oils that are in these devices, it's salt-based nicotine. Cigarettes are free-based nicotine. So these devices, the nicotine is stronger because of it's created in a laboratory and, and because of the formula that's put on them. So the salt-based gives a stronger dopamine release. Dopamine is our neurotransmitter that makes us feel good. Anytime we do something that feels good, bam, we get the dopamine releases left and right. Um, as, a, as a reference, the two most natural dopamine releasers that we have as human beings is sex followed by food, right? So those, those are the two of the, of the dopamine. So the nicotine ends up taking, taking us pretty high ab above sex, and then boom, it's, it's a very severe crash that comes off of the nicotine, which creates the cycling of the cravings. So person takes hit of this vape, they get a dopamine high, they get a dopamine down, the body starts to have physical reactions, triggers and cravings, and, and wanting it, and the only sense of relief is using again. So they take another hit off of the device, alleviate the feelings of, of craving, but then eventually there's going to be the dopamine drop, creating that again. So when Juul who was the first one that came out with this device, and they patented the formula for salt-based nicotine, which is what, what all of these use, their marketing piece was, hey, guess what? This is actually going to save you money in the long run because you don't need to take as many hits to feel the effects of the nicotine. Which, of course, that's very counterintuitive. Because it releases more dopamine, therefore, opening up that cycling of the dependency. I have worked with, wow, many, many teenagers and young adults that have come to, to, to meet with me, <coughs> addicted to these devices, and sitting there crying because they cannot stop. They're like, I've tried and I feel so terrible and I cannot stop. Parents find these devices everywhere. Kids, for some reason, don't throw these devices away. They'll store them at home. Now, I had a family once bring me, as evidence, right, a Target bag full of devices. And then the jewel uses the carts. Same, same kind of thing. But now the disposables are more popular. And are, are we glad that they're not marketing towards children? <laughs> Made me very happy to see that, that truly, right, they, they say what they mean. You know, you got Fruit Loop flavor, s'mores flavor, I don't know about you, I'd rather eat a s'more than smoke a s'more. <laughs> Just saying, right? It's kind of like... Um, I want to get into marijuana. Um, marijuana has also become a very precarious substance. Um, what we're hearing about the marijuana of today is it's old messaging on a new product. The families, the individuals that I work with that have an, an issue with, with marijuana are usually brought in by a loved one. They usually, very rarely, do they come in themselves. Every now and again, that they do. So I'll sit down with you know the teen or the young adult, and we'll talk about the marijuana use, and then they tell me all the reasons it's okay. Um, it'll be, you know, I don't know what the problem is. It's natural. It's a plant. God gave it to me. Nobody's ever died from a weed overdose. It's good. It's good for my glaucoma. It's good for my morning sickness. By the way, a boy told me that one. Um, and then, yeah, you're experiencing morning sickness because we got really big, 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 bigger things to talk about. Um, I drive better when I'm high because I always ask the kids, "Do you drive when you know when you drink? Do you drive?" No, I would never do that. That's, that's, that's great. You know, they're like I'll Uber, which Uber double-edged sword as well too, but. Um, but do you drive high? And they're like, oh yeah. But, but I drive better when I'm high. You know, and I see in the years to come, right, this campaign coming of driving high is, is not a good thing. So, as with anything, if the perceived risk drops, 
the likelihood of persons using something increases. Right now, marijuana is, in, in my opinion, generally speaking, it's not seen as a bad thing. I, I, I feel for these kids because when I was growing up, did people smoke pot? Absolutely, they did. They did. Uh, but you know, it was a house party and you'd see the little group go off behind the house. They weren't doing it in your face. Everybody knew what they were doing, but it wasn't being done right here, like in front of you. You know, today, I mean, it's, it's in our faces all the time. All the time, all the time. I, I work in South Miami. I'm right near Casa Cuba. Uh, very good place. Um, but I can't tell you the, the times that I walk over there for coffee when you, you can just smell it. And you know, and there's times obviously that I've seen it, but you know, the, the smell. So, it, it, and, and the whole idea of it's not a gateway drug. Let me, let me tell you how I define gateway because there's a, there's a lot of debate on that. Um, what I have found based on my experience, and here I'm not going on studies, I'm going on the years that I've been doing this. Everybody that I have met that has done any substance other than marijuana and alcohol started with marijuana and alcohol. This does not mean that people that smoke marijuana are going to go on to try cocaine or Xanax or ecstasy, right? But people that have done other things began there. And what helped in that transition was this stuff makes me feel good, right? We got the dopamine, dopamine going, right? The dopamine. I wonder what this will do. So that's why, in my opinion, and solely my opinion, marijuana is a gateway drug. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's different strains of marijuana. These are the two most popular. We have indica and, and sativa. Indica is the one that helps people calm down, relax, if I'm feeling anxious or I can't sleep, you know. Indica is also known as in the couch because you're kind of like flat, boom, done, right? And then we have the, the sativa, which is the, the I'm going to go out and party. I'm going to clean the house. Well, maybe not clean the house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go out, you know, be active, right? And that's, that's that strain. And now I want to get into the common methods of marijuana use. The ones that <coughs> run along the top is actually the, the flower. This is the flower itself um, in different ways of ingesting it. Running along the bottom, we have, this is, this is called uh, dab. This is concentrated THC oil. It looks like earwax, okay? We have the vape pens, and then we have all the different kinds of edibles. Once again, not marketed towards children, okay? Not marketed towards our, our, our young population. So what does this mean? What do the ways of ingesting mean and, and how it metabolizes in the body? I'm gonna to speak to you before I get into this chart, the potency of marijuana. Back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, right? Peace, love, and happiness. It was about three to 4%, maybe 5% THC. THC is the psychoactive component of the marijuana plant, okay? So back when, three to five, three to five percent. Today, it varies greatly. It can be anything from seven percent all the way up to 100 percent. California, every year, the, the dispensaries, they have a contest where they actually give a, an award, it's a big cup, of who can make the most potent THC. Okay? And then, of course, when people, whoever the winner is, the sales for that go way high. Because remember, people are seeking a feeling. They're seeking a feeling. So it can range. It can range anywhere across the board. So for, for my examples here, on the potency side, I said, you know, between 20 and 35%, but it could be less, it could be more, um, we really don't know. But what is important to know about this is that in the way that it smokes, we have the joint, the hybrid, the blunt, the pipes, the bowls, the bongs, um, 
whatever the person ingests with every hit of whatever device, right, the blunt or what have you, they end up absorbing about 12% of the THC, okay? So it's about a 12% absorption of whatever the potency of the marijuana is with each hit. As we go moving down, dabbing, dabbing was the crystallized form, the one that looked like earwax. There's two different ways of doing that. It could be done through a dab pen, that the pen, the actual uh, device will melt the liquid, the crystals to liquid form, <coughs> or there's a dab bong, which is a complicated thing that they actually have to melt it with a blowtorch. Yes, a blowtorch. <laughs> yes, a blowtorch, right, to melt it down. One hit of a dab, one hit, just one hit, can be the equivalent of four to five joints <coughs> in one hit. I have unfortunately met with teenage girls at this point, more, more than one, about three of them, where they were out with some friends, they were at a party, they were in a group, and their recollection more or less is, hey, you know, I, I, I don't know what happened. I took a, I remember I took a hit with a dab, and then I took a second hit, and then I don't remember anything else that happened. One of these young ladies woke, woke up in the front bushes of her home, naked from the waist down. She doesn't know how she got home. And you know, when, when she kind of came to, because she was in a blackout, right? Blackout is not passed out. In this case, she did end up passing out. But a blackout is you just don't remember. You're still moving, you're going, you're doing things, but you don't remember what is going on. Uh, she knocked on her front door. Parents took her to the hospital. She had been assaulted. And when she asked her friends, what happened? We all went out there together. They were like, <coughs> I don't know what happened. You got really high and you walked off and we tried to get you back and you wouldn't come. How'd I get home? How'd I get home? I don't know. I don't know. Nobody told her anything. You know, so when I speak to the kids, you know, I, this is usually an example I give them. And I also add to it is like, we got to know who we're with. I want friends that if that happens to me, or if I drink too much one night, which can happen to anybody, that they're going to be like, wow, you know what? I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take you home. I'm going to take you to my home. I'm going to you know, get an adult involved, right? And this is happening way too often. The psychosis that's coming with marijuana, too, is pretty prevalent. People that are just thinking, you know, I don't know one young man, you know, who, who thought his mother was poisoning him by putting poison in all the clear liquids in the house, right? This was a, a psychotic break due to marijuana. He got a sledgehammer and started breaking everything that had water. The fish tank, the refrigerator, the swimming pool, the toilets. He wrecked the house because my mother is poisoning me with all the clear liquids in the house. And he was saying that was not true. So the vaping, every hit of a vape pen, the individual absorbs 95% of the THC. So this is creating the higher highs. This is releasing more dopamine, right? More and more dopamine, which comes to the feel good. Remember, the amygdala stores the feeling of being high. It doesn't store all the consequences of it. You look at people with substance use disorders, right? <coughs> substance use disorders don't make sense. It's like, why is this person risking all of this? Right? The reason they're risking it is because they are substance dependent. They're dependent on that dopamine. And then we have the edibles. The edibles, it's actually like a double whammy because we take it in uh, and then it metabolizes one way, and then it metabolizes a different way through the liver. The liver then, you know, converts it, makes it stronger. What we're finding with the edibles is that, you know, bam, I'll eat a gummy, 10 minutes go by, I'm not feeling anything. So what do people do? Eat more gummies. Eat more gummies, <laughs> right? Eat more gummies, eat more gummies, and then we're finding that. The high takes longer to come on, but it lasts longer.
could be a 10, 12 hour high. So when I hear it's natural, it's a plant, what's the problem with wheat? It's not a big deal. Um, I, I think it is a big deal. I truly do think it is a big deal. It's not the pot of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It, it's not what we're seeing anymore at all. Seattle, Washington, there's more dispensaries than Starbucks cafes. This to me is a problem. We need more coffee. <laughs> Marijuana is medicine. I hear this all the time too, right? It's like, but it's good for me, it's medicine. And, and as adults, we know that just because something's legal doesn't mean it's good for us. Lots of legal, cigarettes are legal. I haven't heard anybody say, well, you know, cigarettes are legal, that's why I smoke them. Never heard that. So, when, I'll, I'll be very honest and transparent with you. When this first came out, I was screaming bloody murder. I would have stood on US 1 on my little soapbox and been like, what, ah, don't do this, right? Um, but then, uh, you know, I was like, okay, I gotta I got figure out what this is. I, I, I gotta really dive deep in. So I did a lot, a lot, a lot of research. And, and what I learned from all of this is that there's definitely very good properties in the marijuana plant. You know, it's really helped a lot of people. Um, I think I'm glad it's continued to be studied because it, it, there, there's a lot of benefit. Now, the big distinction is, is that the part of the marijuana plant that seems to be the most helpful is the CBD, the cannabis, not the THC. THC is a psychoactive component. Now, there's some formulas that are done that have a little bit of THC for certain conditions, but with these kids, listen, I don't think, I have yet to meet a teenager, young adult, that suffers from glaucoma, that has some of these other conditions, right? And kind of look at them and I'm like, well, well, what's wrong with you? Nothing, it's preventive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I give them credit, they keep me, they keep me on my toes. You know, they, they keep me on my toes. Every time I think I'm ready that, you know, I can come right back at them, and then it has preventive. You know? Um, so, um, it, it, as with anything, you know, if somebody has a, a condition that can benefit from this, go see a doctor that really knows this, go to an MD, get, it, get yourself checked, really know if it's something that can be helpful to you. And with people that have substance use disorders, either an abuse or a dependence, you know, i extra cautious with these folks because it, it opens up the, it, that pathway for the dependency. Kids tell me, you know, what's the big deal with weed? Weed is not addictive. Weed is addictive. How do we define if something is addictive? Is that if there are withdrawal symptoms. It's a simple, simple formula. Caffeine, withdrawal symptoms, right? If we stop, if I stop my coffee, you know, for a couple days, I, I, I feel it. Marijuana, what are the withdrawal symptoms? I've met, you know, again, teens and young adults, appetite issues, sleep issues, anxiety, paranoia, uh, uh, and pretty prevalent. Pretty, pretty prevalent. The good news is in about two, three weeks that those are much, much, much better after that period of time. Um, so it's important to know, right? It's important to have the correct information so that one is able to make the best decisions possible in, in their lives. Um, people do not drive better when they're high, by the way. Uh, it's been proven over and over again. Um, you know, lots of car accidents. Um, and, uh, oh, Delta 8, anybody heard of Delta 8? A few people, okay, so Delta 8 is 100% laboratory made. It has THC, but at a lesser content uh, than regular THC. The individuals that I've worked with that smoke Delta 8, each and every one, and again, no, please, this is, I'm going on my personal experience. On, on my personal experience. I've asked them, oh, so, so why'd you make the switch? You know, what, what, what's, what's going on here? And they've all said, well, you know, I've had some really bad psychosis with, you know, <coughs> Delta 9, which is our THC. So this one, I get less psychosis. I'm like, oh, okay. This substance use disorders lack logic, right? 
Because one would think, if I think that there's purple elephants and dinosaurs in the back of the room that are coming, you know, to stab me, once I get over that experience, I don't want smaller elephants and dinosaurs. <laughs> I don't want any of them. They're like, no, these are more manageable. I can, I can hurt that one. So it's, it's in the thinking. And it's 100% laboratory made. Therefore, that means we really don't know what is in it. You know, and it's not good, it's synthetic. Marijuana has already been listed on a number of death certificates as a contributing cause. Never direct, people do not die from marijuana overdoses, that is correct, okay? Nobody has ever died from a marijuana overdose, that is correct. Marijuana does not affect the brain stem. The brain stem is what's taking care of absolutely everything that we're not thinking about right now. Thank God that we don't have to think about it. Breathing, heart rate, blood pressure, kidneys, pancreas, liver, you know, all our, our body's doing everything that it needs to do, but we're not thinking about putting all of our systems here um, to work. So um, I'm going to tell you a couple of these stories. In fact, I'm going to stick to, to these two right here. So Daniel, um, Daniel's 18-year-old young man, he was studying out at the University of Colorado. Uh, in Colorado, I know we're all thinking, oh, Colorado, of course. Colorado also has a very strong recovery community. They have very strong on both ends. Um, so he was living off campus, but in one of those apartment buildings that tended to be most, mostly students. So he, and this is the report from the people that were with him, so the you know, words I'm using come from the actual report. So he was hanging out with his buddies. They were hitting a, a dab pen, right? So all of a sudden, his friend said that he just started to look unwell, and he flipped out, right? As he flipped out, he just went running out of their apartment. As he goes running out of their apartment, he's taking off all his clothes, shirt, shorts, underwear, shoes, socks. He got to his apartment. He was totally naked. He went into the kitchen, grabbed the knife, and started stabbing himself until a pool he got his jugular. He bled to death in his kitchen floor. What happened, what was going on in his mind, what was the psychosis, unknown. But the bottom line was that he ended up dead. Uh, and from what the family reports, you know, he didn't have any underlying or past history of, of mental health disorders. But again, that's, that's a family, you know, report. And this one here, we have a family, husband, wife, three children, um, again, in Colorado. So, so he had a marijuana candy about the size of a Tootsie Roll, right? And, and from the reports are that um, when he, he got home, he actually didn't even go in the front door. He kind of jumped in the front window at the house. And he was telling his wife, you know, you have to kill me, you have to kill me. If you don't kill me, the Nazis are coming and they're going to take it and they're going to kill our entire family. Right, so he's going on, you know, with, with this, this is what's going on in his mind. Um, she picks up the phone, she calls 911, she's telling the operator, look, I don't know what's going on, my husband is saying this, he's not well, we need help. So they dispatch, you know, ambulance and police. The husband, at some point, apparently hears her calling 911. Goes to the, the safe at home, opens the safe, pulls out a revolver. Grabs his wife and the three kids, sit them all down in the living room. And as the police, or the ambulance, whatever's getting closer, he's getting more and more agitated. He goes up to his wife, puts the gun between her eyes, and shoots. The three children were present there. Those children became orphans really on that day. They lost their mother, they lost their father, the trauma left behind. So what's the big deal? It's just a little bit of weed. What's the big deal? This is not the marijuana of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know, we have old messaging on a very, very new, new <coughs> product. And there's more, obviously, as you can see. You know, so the, these are death certificates already with marijuana as a contributing factor. Now I want to get to alcohol. Uh, prevalence, right? Binge drinking. Um, teenagers and young adults, do they drink because of the taste? No. 
do. They, they, they don't drink because of the taste. They drink because of the effect. So what's important to know is that kids and teenagers, uh, teenagers and young adults drink faster than we do because they're drinking for the effect, right? So they drink quicker. Um, the signal that we get as adults when we've had you know, a drink or two and it's kind of like, ooh, I'm feeling a little tipsy, you know, their signal is slower than ours. The liver does not fully metabolize until about the age of 20, so they metabolize alcohol differently than, than we do. The psychological skills to deal with intoxication that they have is different than ours, right? They're learning how to drink. Well, we as adults have already had, you know, our experiences um, with alcohol, and we do have to remember that their reward center is really what they're driven by. They're not driven by the executive function and the ability to think through. Teenagers as well, um, <coughs> they're not very good with impulse control. Uh, very natural part of teenagers, they're learning how to do that, so their impulse control is less than ours as well too. So, looking at all of that, that's the reason that the drinking age here is 21. Um, if you can't tell, I'm from a Hispanic background. I know you can't tell, right? <laughs> uh, the, the dark hair and eyes, definitely in the accent, Miami accent doesn't give it away at all. Um, but there's certain cultures, a lot of European, Central, South American, Caribbean cultures, that kids start drinking at a very young age, right? At 15, 16, they have, you know, la copita de vino, their little glass of wine or whatever as part of the culture. Um, so, you know, I've had families say to me, well, you know, I, I, I want to teach my child to drink at home. You know, it makes sense because we do, we, we, we do know that the kids are going to at some point experiment. So, but my, my, my response to that is that that's probably not a very good idea at a young age. Uh, because for, for these reasons here, and because if they have the green light at home, even though we say you can only do this at home, it gives the green light for them to do it not at home. Even though I know you're very clear about it. Because then they'll go out, they'll be at a, at a friend's house, and then the friend's parents maybe provide alcohol or what have you, and your son or daughter comes home tipsy or drunk, and it's kind of like, you know, what are you doing? And it's like, but their parents were there and drank with you, right? And then it gets into this whole very gray area. Um, it's important to set limits and bounds, you know, and also being aware of family history. Substance use disorders can be genetic. So if, if there is someone in the family or a few people in the family, that's okay. We just need to know that we're predisposed and educating, and we would educate on anything else. Your family has heart disease, your family has high blood pressure, diabetes, right? Same kinds of steps that we would take is that we need to be a little extra careful because of our family history. This is a, a F fMRI, a functional MRI, of two 15-year-old uh, boys working on a, on a school activity, right? Here you, and they're both sober at this time. Here you have a 15-year-old that's been drinking for about a year versus a 15-year-old that doesn't have, hasn't had alcohol. It's amazing the brain, the way the brain uh, functions with alcohol at a young age. Statistically, <coughs> And I think marijuana follows very similarly. Alcohol, marijuana. The lo longer you can hold off, the better their chances are of not developing a substance issue. You take a person that starts drinking at the age of 15, and I'm not talking drinking at, at you know super high levels, right? Just that whole social weekends kind of thing. Uh, to somebody that starts drinking at the age of 20, the the the. 20-year-old reduces his or her chances of developing an alcohol dependence issue by 70%, 7-0. To me, that is a significant number. I'm not a math person. One plus one equals 11. You know, so 70% is definitely huge. And 
what the studies are showing with marijuana, they're still kind of premature, looking like it's pretty similar. Because remember, we got the young brain, the dopamine release, the brain is maturing, and all the feel goods are being stored, and it's being stored in the neural netting of the developing brain as, oh my gosh, you know what, I need this for the rest of my life to feel good and to survive. So, very important there. So alcohol poisoning, um, I did cover this with the kids because anybody can overdrink one day. It can happen to anybody. But knowing what to do and how to intervene. Uh, sleeping it off isn't always the best thing, right? It, it, it depends, it's gonna be on a case by case. Um, and I definitely encourage them to seek help, you know, because uh, either emergency room, 911, your parent, person's parent, somebody's parent, right? involve an adult um, into this, because um, this, this is real and it does happen. So there is you know, laws related to providing substances or alcohol to minors, right? You could be liable for it. Um, signs and symptoms, what are some things to, to look for? Do you want me to go back to the other slide? You were, some of yeah. you were taking pictures, sorry. Yeah. Uh, one, more. I just, one more? So what are some, some signs and symptoms to, to, to look for? We definitely want to look at any kind of emotional problems. Now, emotional, teenagers are emotional beings, right? They're going to be emotional. They're learning how to deal with emotions. Their emotions are magnified. I don't know if you notice that your kids' emotions are magnified. Uh, when they're mad, they're mad. When they're sad, they're really sad. And they're happy, you know. They're happy, but they're learning how to cope and manage with their emotions. But anything that kind of comes out of the bell curve, anything that seems more extreme. Um, family conflicts, again, beyond your average teenage family conflicts. Um, any kind of psychiatric problems, relationship, educational, and social. There's a change of friends, change of vocabulary. You know how you know we got they go to Google for everything. If you hear a term that you don't know, like for example, if you hear your son or daughter saying, "Hey, I'm gonna get a green monkey this weekend." Anybody know what a green monkey is? Okay, so you go to Google green monkey, and that's an ecstasy pill. Okay, that's one of one of the terms that they have for ecstasy pills. And ultra fast, right? Just uh, one by which always terrifies me. Um, so and paying attention to those things. Um, see, and being secretive, again, they're teenagers. They're gonna be in their room with the door closed and locked, right? But above and beyond what's considered average for a teenager. Um, isolation, isolation is huge. I think, you know, going with the pandemic piece as well too, our kids were isolated for too long. That's not good. We are neurobiologically wired to have connections and to have relationships. So if they're isolated or lonely, you know, these are all things definitely, you know, to look for. So um, what's, what's your job as a parent? Say what you mean, mean what you say, and don't say it mean. No is a complete sentence, right? Be very cautious of gray areas. I've heard parents tell their kids, you know, in my office, I prefer that you don't smoke marijuana. For a 15, 16 year old, I'm going to tell you, prefer is not a word to use because they're going to be like, oh, green light score, got this. You know, you told me to make my best decision and I did. Uh, no, we need to be very, very clear. You know, gray areas do not work well for, for, for kids. Uh, expectations have to be created for them. Um, you need to be their helmet. Their brain is developing, but you have to be their helmet. You have to set the parameters. You've got to set the rules. You have to set the expectations based on the values of your family, right? Doesn't matter maybe what this family over here is doing, but the values in our families, our family is this. And it's important that you, you, you live by that. Make the tough decisions for them. You know, they're going through a period where they're discovering themselves. They're going to want to fit in. But there's a big difference between fitting in and belonging. Teach them how to belong. How do you teach them how to belong? Is by setting up the expectations in the containers. Setting up those lines. I like to use the analogy of like, you know, the road that we draw, drive on that has two lanes. 
right? You draw those two lanes. If they do well, you open them little by little. If they step on those lanes or they go out, they're letting us know that they had too much space to navigate. We tighten up those lines for them. It's a very teaching experience, right? This is where you get grounded. I experienced that a number of times in my life, uh, right? And we go with this back and forth, but that's very, very, very teaching. And please, consequences. Consequences are the best teachers. We need to have consequences for our actions. They have to feel it. Take away the phone for 48 hours. See if we can manage that right here. And I'm trying really hard for somebody to take away my phone for 24 hours and they won't. Uh, but for them, they feel it, right? They need to feel it. And plus, getting away from some of that screen time also may not be a bad thing because you all know about social media and all the posts and that's a whole different lecture that can take you know, a whole school year uh, to, to go over that. Uh, there's lots of benefits to the rules and structure. Right? You are the helmet. It allows you to set up the expectations. Um, it also allows them to, to, to learn, and to learn to connect the reward center to the executive function. Right? Oh boy, if I do this, my parents already told me, if I do this, this is what's gonna happen. You know what, I don't wanna get grounded for another month, so I'm not gonna do it. Right? It teaches the connection of the, of the back to front. And it also increases trust, by the way. Say what you mean, mean what you say, and don't say it mean. If this, then that. You know, we don't have to argue about it. You knew about it. They're going to argue about it anyways, but you don't have to. Setting up the consequences, it needs to be immediate. Right? We can't do something over like two weeks ago when you forgot to empty the dishwasher, now you're grounded. It, it, it's not going to make sense, and it's not going to have the effect. You need to be consistent. If you say you're grounded for a week, <coughs> Go the entire week because if you get it, you know, they, all of a sudden they're going to be like, oh, you know what, mom, I'm going to do laundry and take out the trash. Kids try that, right? I'm going to be extra nice to you. Can I go out this weekend? I'm still grounded, but you know, I, I took out the trash, I washed the dog, right? No, because then they, they learn to manipulate, right? They learn to manipulate and, and, and get around us. And it should be appropriate to the broken <coughs> Not everything that's legal is good for us. And I always get a kick out of this, right? The cigarette companies knew that nicotine was bad for us, but they didn't tell us anything. So these are like my three top favorites. I show this to your kids too. I love this one. Dr. Batty's asthma cigarettes. Any asthma cigarettes, right? So, so, so here's what you gotta do, right? It's for the temporary relief of asthma and it effectively treats asthma, hay fever, foul breath, all diseases of the throat, head cold, canker sores, and bronchial irritations. So, if you're experiencing any of these things, please smoke Dr. Baddies and you'll be fine. However, not recommended for children under six. So if you give it to your five-year-old, you and I are gonna have problems. I'm gonna check to see when they were born. Right? More camel, more doctors smoke camels. So hey, I'll tell you this though, when I was a, when I was a kid, I was born in 1971, have no problem saying that my pediatrician would smoke. And I remember him, he would listen to my lungs as he had a cigarette hanging out of his lungs. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and 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 he had three separate offices and each one get a big Aztec sun ashtray. And to me, at that time, I thought my parents would talk for way too long with my doctor, so what was my way to get out? You know, Blow the ash, and, and I always got the, okay, we're leaving now, and I was like, thank God. You know? uh, but yeah, so he smoked camels. He's not around anymore, but it had nothing to do with the cigarettes, right? And Nico Time cigarettes. If you're pregnant, please, that's the right, that's the right brand to go, right? Just because something is legal does not mean it's good for us. Uh, so, you know, God bless you all uh, for being the parents that you are. God bless Palmer Trinity for, for the work that you do and in supporting. Um, sometimes my kids think I'm getting on their back. What they don't know is you're probably the only one that has their back. So my heart appreciates you for being the parents that you are and um, i wish you a happy tuesday so thank you